Hi, good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today uh, Derek Beaulieu at this bonus round North of Invention event. Um, back in January, we had four days of readings, dialogues, and presentations by a wide range of Canadian poets here at the Writers' House and at Poets' House in New York. Um, and this was all organized by Sarah Dowling and Charles Bernstein. And if you didn't get a chance to check out those events, they are all online um, at Penn Sound, and I definitely encourage you um, to, to listen to some of those events. Um, but today's event, featuring the Calgary artist Derek Beaulieu, provides a wonderful continuation of the conversation. At the forefront of Canadian innovative poetics, Beaulieu's hybrid genre art practice merges the fields of conceptual art, poetry, fiction, editing, criticism, publishing, and bookmaking. He's the author of five books of poetry, most recently the visual poem Sweet, published by the Irish press Red Fox in 2010, and three volumes of conceptual fiction, most recently the short fiction collection How to Write, put out by Talon Books, and his eagerly awaited first volume of criticism, Scene of the Crime, is also forthcoming from Snare Books. So as you can see, he's a busy guy. Um, <laughs> his work has appeared in over 150 journals internationally, and has been translated into Turkish, Polish, French, and Icelandic, and has been featured in over 200 small press publications. His exciting visual poetry and conceptual writing is displayed on the walls of the Writer's House today, uh, which is also known as the Brodsky Gallery, and I encourage you to spend some time with it after the reading. I first met Derek in 2001 when I moved to Calgary to do my MA in Poetics, and he was also enrolled in the program. And I had gone to Calgary because it had bec become the place to go study poetics in Canada. And upon arriving, I quickly realized that Derek's writing, as well as his extensive involvement in the community as editor of magazines such as Filling Station and his work as publisher of House Press, had played a vital role in putting Calgary on the poetics map of North America. Derek's work as publisher and as bookmaker, first with the prolific House Press from 1997 to 2004, and now with No Press, forms a central part of his creative practice. And I will say that House Press has produced some of the most beautiful chapbooks that I've ever seen, featuring an eclectic range of experimental writing by some of the most interesting poets out there. Through these projects, Derek advances his own unique genre of community book art. The word concrete is one that cannot be escaped when engaging with Derek's art, especially when he gives you one of his hand-bound books. In the exchange of hands, he returns us to the materiality of writing, the mark, the stain, the body, the computer, the scratch, the pen, the exacto knife, the paper, the printer, the luminous immediacy, each letter pressing into a concrete curve of relation between writer and reader. When I first moved to Calgary many years ago, Derek was incredibly welcoming to me. So please join me in returning the long overdue favor and giving Derek Villeneuve a warm welcome to Philadelphia and to the Writer's House today. Thank you, Janet. And um, thank you so much, everybody here at the Writer's House and the folks that I was able to um, interact with in, in New York as well. Um, it's kind of surprising. This is the first opportunity I've had to read in the United States since 2003. So a lot has changed uh, in those years. The last time I read was at, uh, was at the Exchange Rate Reading Series in Laurie Emerson's kitchen. And, and so it, it's, it's a real pleasure to have an opportunity to speak here especially having, having the chance to not only engage you at, at the podium, but also on the walls. There are three excerpts from projects I've worked on over the last eight or so years. This room and the one directly behind us uh, feature excerpts from the newspaper, which is a 124 painting series that I've done that engage with a single day's newspaper. Each one of these paintings is acrylic on paper and reproduces a single page of an average issue of the Calgary Herald, the daily newspaper that, uh, from the city in which I live. For each painting, what I did was I remapped a, a page out of the newspaper and organized each of the articles according to subject matter. So international news, national news, 
uh, provincial news and local, as well as sports, entertainment, business, health, and three different types of advertising. So any advertising or devices that the Calgary Herald ran as part of its, um, its part of its shape, so crossword puzzles, indexes, mastheads, that was one shade of gray. Another shade of gray was any purchased ads. Another shade of gray was the classifieds and the obituaries. And then the final uh, black was assigned to flyers and inserts. So over about two and a half years, I created this series of paintings. And this is its uh, first opportunity to be shown th th to this extent. And I consider this part of a uh, bo both concrete poetry and conceptual writing. It's writing to be looked at. It's writing to be engaged with at the level of text, but without any text there. The room directly behind uh, the kind of sitting area, living room space, uh, the one that has the large dining room table in it. I, do these rooms have names other than, you know, living room, dining room? Pardon me? Arts, cafe. Arts cafe, living room, dining room. Okay, so in the dining room, uh, <laughs> The dining room is surrounded by pieces uh, which are examples of my visual poetry using Letraset. Letraset is um, a no longer used, basically an antiquated form of um, a device used for graphic design by which graphic designers could standardize their lettering. It was uh, dry transfer, so rub off lettering that was applied one letter at a time. That uh, Letraset basically doesn't produce Letraset uh, dry transfer lettering anymore. They produce a few uh, leaflets here and there for uh, mostly hobbyists and scrapbookers. At one point, there were thousands upon thousands of different types, sizes, shapes, windings, borders, brackets, <laughs> even musical notation. And I've had to find these at you know flea markets and you know corner um, art supply stores that are covered in dust. So basically, my chosen medium is no longer created. It's if you were like, okay, well, I, I'm, a, I'm an artist. I, I draw and I use entirely lead pencils, which they don't make anymore. Now, how are you actually going to have to adjust your practice? So that means every letter I put down on one of these pieces, I never get to use again. That's it. Because I only have, you know, basically 100, 150 different sheets. Once you apply the letter off the sheet of dry transfer lettering, it's stuck to the canvas it's no longer available to you, and I can't buy this material anymore. Which means, means basically, you better be sure that what you're doing is what you want to be doing because you have one chance. It can't be peeled up and replaced, it's stuck down. To remove it, destroys it. So that has, a, has affected my, um, my practice somewhat and actually ends up being very close to uh, well, it, it informs my editing practice quite a bit because now, you know, you are being very aware at the level of the letter, at the level of every single mark that goes on the page because there's a, um, a pressure to make sure that you use them correctly because you only have one opportunity. And then thirdly, in a uh, display case in the uh, stairway uh, lobby area <laughs> is a um, uh, display case you can look down into which exhibits... Uh, 20 examples from Flatland, which is a book that I had published in the UK by Information as Material, and that is a uh, conceptual visual novel, which replies to every single page of Edwin Abbott Abbott's 1890s novel of the same name, whereby I traced a line from the first appearance of every letter in the first line of text all the way down the page for every single page, all hundred and some odd pages in his Victorian novel, which left a series of graphs that look very much like EKG readings or Richter, uh, Richter results that suggest an encoded reading, suggest the plainer ideas of, of Ad Edwin Abbott Abbott's original novel. Flatland was a novel that postulated a two-dimensional world, a flat land, a plain which is occupied by a series of different polygons. And the more planes that you had in your polygon, the higher up you were placed in its class-based society. It was actually written as a screed in support of education for women. Because women in Flatland are all triangles. They only have three planes, while men are at least squares. <laughs> right. And the priests, the priestly class, are 
almost circles. They have so many planes that the planes are so tiny that they become effectively circles and that everybody should aspire to become circular. Well-rounded, you see. <laughs> so what happens is, is that our hero, A square, is visited one day by a sphere, which, you know, a three-dimensional object, which he perceives as a series of pulsating circles. <coughs> you know, 38 years old, my voice is still cracking. <laughs> as a series of pulsating circles, a point that expands and contracts. If you imagine a ball trying to pass its way through a sheet of paper. And this sphere is here to pass along the gospel of three dimensions, saying that actually the way you see your world, it needs to be expanded. You need to grow beyond the ideas of restricting education for the, along the number of planes that you have. So this sphere takes a square and tours him around point land, line land, plane land, and all the way into the three-dimensional world that we exist in. This book has remained in print now for over 120 years, not because it's a particularly interesting science fiction novel, trust me, it's not, but because it's mostly read now by physicists who are trying to postulate how to describe a four- or five-dimensional world using the language of three dimensions, what we have. Edwin Abbott Abbott had to try to explain a three-dimensional world in the language of two dimensions. So it's now continues to stay uh, in print as a metaphor on how to use scientific language. So I ba basically went through and mapped his entire text into a single plane, letting those letters move across the page in a series of polygons. So that's available in the display case. That was published uh, by Simon Morris's um, conceptual, uh, conceptually driven press information as material in York and is now available on Ubu as a, as a full text PDF. I wasn't planning on reading from a, um, from Fragments from the Frag Pool, uh, but uh, due to popular demand. Fragments from the Frag Pool is a series of playful translations that Gary Barwin and I uh, produced uh, throughout the late 90s and early 2000s uh, as a collaborative novel by or a collaborative series of poems by which we never met. We wrote the entire thing over, over email, uh, through correspondence. We only met on the day of the launch. So we proofed it over the internet, we did everything, we corresponded it, we crafted this book entirely over, over email. And it's a series of playful translations of a haiku by Matsuo Basho. Now Matsuo Basho is a 17th century haiku poet and the, what, I, what I find, he lived from uh, seven, 1644 to 1694. What I think is just fantastic now is basically he just wandered rural Japan writing his poems on, on rocks and carving them into tree trunks and trading his poetics for, you know, for food and for shelter and for clothing. There are some um, historians now who actually believe that Matsuo Basho was a masterless ninja. And I don't know about you, but I can't think of anything cooler than a ninja poet. So Gary Barwin and I started with the accepted uh, traditional translation of Basho's poem, which reads, the old pond, a frog jumps in, the sound of water. The monk Dom Sylvester Udyard in the 1960s wrote a minimalist translation which reads, pond, frog, plop. Those three words have spawned an entire, a very, very small tradition of translating Basho's poem into a series of playful poems that, that have been engaged with by Gary, myself, uh, BP Nichol, Steve McCaffrey, and many, many others. And this was our uh, addition to this uh, obsessive subgenre. Email to Basho. Re-pond, respond. Yeah, and it kind of continues in that. The body is 98% water, each cell a tiny pool. Basho, I said, you sit in silence. Yes, he said, a billion frogs make little sound. Frog, you are old as I, the old leaps flagging the weary mind. Frond friend, the water sounds sound fallow 
without you. Frogs on fronds in the bog pond, log heap, leap, lily pads, pools. Throngs prodding, sudden sink, sudden or brink, brink, brink or, or bog brink. Think bog frog, fog sound, sound cool. Basho, frog in the throat, leaps in the mind. Old pond, it's a good thing it wasn't a rhinoceros. I'm not going to do too many of these. Numbered series one, fur old og, spool po shnt, uh, spool old ash po fruitant og, uh, spool fur ash og, spool old ash po fruitant og. The old man asleep by the pond, toad told the tale. Old pond has frogs, also time. So we tried to uh, run this poem through a series of translators, through a series of uh, thesauruses and thesauri online. Matsuo, uh, Matsuo Basho's poem, when read by Microsoft Word Thesaurus, comes up, cool, frog in one's throat, drops noisily. <laughs> Oxyacetylene welding nutshell, noxious dope fiend, non-transparent Dixieland, is how Microsoft Word translates Basho's original Japanese. <laughs> old, frond, old frog, wart found a polyp. Yeah, I know. From Haiku Night in Canada. I'm not gonna get into the flyers. Moon, a yellow puck, poet plops, Frog into pond, yes, he shoots, he scores. Oh, frog leaping into the center of itself. Old pond, no gravity. Frog leaps over the surface of sound. Gravity splashes in an old man's mind. A frog jumps. The division of pond and frog breaks down. The pond is identical in size and shape to the frog. In its formative stages, the pond was a drop of water. Seeing it suddenly glisten, one could easily have mistaken it for a tadpole. The pond leaps, surrounding the frog like a raincoat. It is believed that the pond opened before the actual and apparently sudden impact of the frog. As the frog ponds, the pond frogs. The moment of illumination is not that instant when the frog hits the surface of the pond. It is that moment when the frog knows it's going to leap, that moment when the pond prepares to open. It is that moment when the path between frog and pond first finds its form, arching from lily pad to the filigreed edge of broken meniscus. We are deceived by the sound of water. Old man leaps, follows an idea into the pond. Old pond, frog jumps in, homelessness, lessness. Old pond, frog, Listlessness. Something. Something, somethings. Something. Dlo. Dnop. Po. A gorf. The frog is gone. Its splash only reaches me now. So that was the series of translations that tried to undo, uh, certainly undo faithfulness in favor of playfulness. Gary and I have continued to uh, collaborate. He's recently done a sound uh, performance uh, translation of one of my um, visual novels, a novel that was published in, um, in Finland by the name of Local Color, which is a visual translation of Paul Oster's book, Ghosts. How to Write is my most recent book. How to Write is a series of conceptual short fictions. I didn't write a word in it. I stole it, I sampled it, I swiped it, and I remixed it, which caused all sorts of consternation in terms of copyright. But this work is all available online for free or in book form for slightly more than free. <laughs> it starts with a pair of quotations, the first from Lawrence Stern, Shall we forever make new books as apothecaries make new mixtures by pouring only out of one vessel and into another? 
Are we forever to be twisting and untwisting the same rope? And from Walter Benjamin, but when shall we actually write books like catalogs? It begins with a series of study questions entitled Nothing Odd Can Last. I searched out as many study questions as I could find based on Lawrence Stern's The Life and Opinions of Tristan Shandy and found a, a series of Coles Notes style websites that provided insight not only into that book but into most books. <laughs> Are the body passages and double entendres important in this book? Could it have been removed? Does the author guide his pen or does his pen guide him? Does she have redeeming qualities? Notice how the author is always assumed to be he and the characters in need of redeeming are always women. Blame Cole's notes. Does the novel demonstrate that there can be postmodern texts before postmodernism? Do you think the author intended to end the novel with the ninth volume? How do we account for the author's strikingly unsentimental treatment at times of such topics as love and death? How does the seventh volume, in which the narrator describes his travels through Europe, relate to the rest of the book? How ironic is their presentation? How much control do you think the writer has over his mixture of digression, both kinds, and the narrator's history? How sentimental and gushy is the author of this work? If the latter is true, what justification can be found for that? If you were a reader like the lady, who reads, quote, straightforwards, more in quest of the adventures than in deep erudition and knowledge, how would you feel about the novel? <laughs> in what way are such details important to the author's method? In what way is it possible to reconcile the statement that the book will be kept a-going for 40 years with a contention that the novel is completed? Is it legitimate for an author to require or even request that the reader do things like imagine for yourself, replace misplaced chapters, and put up with omitted chapters. Is kind-heartedness necessarily mawkishness? Is she as stupid as she seems? Is the author in control of his digressions and merely affecting their spontaneity? Or does the story actually run away from him and have to be reined back in? Is the writer unable to present a straightforward story, or does he deliberately frustrate the reader? Is there any importance to this, or is it just the author's bodiness? Is there sufficient justification for such passages, or should the reader say, to heck with it? <laughs> I, I noticed that some people have already got up and left. What are some of the qualities that the writer of this book has inherited from his forebearers? And what does this indicate about the writer's plan and his control of what he was doing? What evidence is there that the narrator's childhood traumas actually influence his adult personality? What is the author's attitude towards science? What is the effect of the precise visual details given in this book? What is the effect of the narrator's frequent address to his audience? What is the relationship between the I that narrates the story and the author? What kinds of scenes receive this treatment? Which predominate? Why? Or why not? <laughs> Would it make sense to interpret this novel psychoanalytically? Would you agree for or against this statement? Would you rather that they were deleted from it? And then there were none is the second piece in the book. And then there were none is a response a rereading of Agatha Christie's novel of the same name, which was originally known by, as Ten Little Indians and before that by, with, by a much more unfortunate title. This is a uh, co condensation and a rewrite of every chapter, the entire novel. It starts also with a pair of quotations, the first from Gertrude Stein. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And from the Ramones, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Chapter one. Another two, all sum, all sum, seven, eight, one, five, a swarm, five, one, a hundred, a hundred, a hundred, one hundred, sixty-five, every half, some two, one or two, thirty thousands, a couple, some half, some ten, fifteen, eighty, another hundred, a bit, a few, several, six, only one, the lot, eight. Chapter two. 
A little group, four, two, one, five, three, one, two. One, a lot, a lot. Three, a mere cluster. Two, three, one, two, double the number. One, a queer lot, this lot, a queer one. One, one, hundreds and hundreds, eight. Another two, two, eight. Ten, one, ten, one, nine, nine, one. Eight, eight, one, seven, seven, one, six, six, one, five, five, one, four, four, one, four, four, one, three, three, one, two, two, one, 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 one. None, one, or two. All two, three, very few, one, two. Skip ahead and keep you in suspense. <laughs> Six, some, few, nine, two, one, one, some, ten, one, seven, eight, eight, ten, ten, two, two, ten, 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 nine, eight, eight, eight. Chapter seven. Two, one, twenty, once. One, two, one, twelve, two, two, ten, eight, ten, one, nine, nine, one, eight, two, one, one, three. Chapter 16, which would be the climax of the novel. A thousand. <laughs> two, one, one, two, one, two, nine, one, one, three, two, one, one, none. And the epilogue. Ten, two, three, one, a lot. Nine, ten, two, two, one, one, ten, 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 one, ten, one, two, thirty six, eight, ten, two, eleven, three, one, three, one, one hundred, one, two, one, one, ten, two, ten, one, one, twenty one, one, two, one, one, seven, one, a quarter, two, one, two, one, one, three, one, one, three, one, one, ten, four, four, one, ten. Mary Reinhold Roberts, in 1920, wrote a novel entitled The Bat, which would have faded entirely into obscurity if Bob Kane hadn't watched the movie version of the book and invented his response character, Batman. I've gone through Mary Reinhold Roberts' original novel, The Bat, and excerpted every sentence that included the words, The Editor, and created a new Piece, The Editor, a detective story. A city editor at lunch with a colleague pulled at his cigarette and talked. Oh, for lay off it, will you? said the city editor peevishly. The editor spread out his hands. The editor frowned. The editor was emphatic. The editor laughed grimly. The editor smiled. His companion rose as well, but it was evident that the editor's theory had taken firm hold on his mind. The editor paused in the doorway. Well, said the editor, <laughs> you won't let it go any further. Tall, reticently good-looking, and well, if inconspicuously clothed and groomed, he by no means seemed the typical detective that the editor had spoken of so scornfully. Cross it over it is either instructions on how to tie a series of neckties or instructions on how to do something rather more pornographic. Cross it over it, bring it up through it, and then back down. Pull it underneath it into the right, back through it into the right again so that it is inside out. Back through it across from front to right to left. Pull it up through it again, bring it down through it in front using both hands, tighten carefully, and draw it up. <laughs> Cross it over it, bring it around and behind it. Bring it up, pull it through, bring it in front, around front, over from right to left again, bringing it up and through. Bring it down in front using both hands, tighten it carefully, and draw it up. Start with it under it. Take it over and under it. Pull it down and tighten it. Take it over to the right. Pull it up behind it. Bring it through it and tighten it gently. <laughs> in the 1960s, starting in 1963, Roy Lichtenstein did a series of paintings by which he appropriated frames out of comic books. Painted those Th those comic book frames in monumental scale and often would have uh, thought balloons and speech bubbles embedded in these paintings. The strange thing is, is that now he has an extremely litigious estate who has actually sought after anyone who uses the same frames he used and has issued cease and desist orders for plagiarism. <laughs> this is my attempt 
to steal back my comic book collection from Roy Lichtenstein and consists of all of the text used in all of his paintings in the order by which they were in which they were painted. It's entitled, I can see the whole room and there's nobody in it. One. Look, Mickey, I've hooked a big one. Tweet. It's, it's not an engagement ring, is it? I can see the whole room and there's nobody in it. Am I, I'm supposed to report to a Mr. Bellamy. I wonder what he's like. Knock, knock. Ring, lip, zing. I tried to reason it out. I tried to see things from mum and dad's viewpoint. I tried not to think of Eddie. So my mind would be clear and common sense could take over, but Eddie kept coming back. I have something for you to eat in the kitchen, dear. I'm not hungry, mother, please. I want to go to my room. Forget it. Forget me. I'm fed up with your kind. Why, Brad, darling, this painting is a masterpiece. My, soon you'll have all of New York clamoring for your work. Perf. Flatten, sand fleas, thung. The exhausted soldiers, sleepless for four and five and six days at a time, always hungry for decent chow, suffering from the tropical fungus infections, kept fighting. Taka taka. As I, I, as I started clipping a mig's tail, this hot shot jet out that I'm in will treat me like a vet pilot when I return from my number one winding with a report of target destroyed. Brat -a -tat. That was their mistake because it gave me more targets than I could shoot at. Number four, one more to make ace. Brat -a -tat -a -tat. Tax! Blam! Take cover! Live ammo. Right now, if they're watching me, they've got to make up their minds whether I don't know they're here and will pass by letting the outfit be sucked into a trap, or whether I do know they're here and I'm about to fire at them. But where did they come from? Not the sea. We've had our eyes glued to it, and we know there ain't an airfield on this island. Where did they come from? Where did they come from? Just then, blang! Zing! Bwee! Ha ha ha! I... I'll think about it. Four. Oh, Jeff, I love you too, but... Sweet dreams, baby. Wham! Good morning, darling. Oh, all right. No, thank you. We rose up slowly, as if we didn't belong to the outside world any longer, like swimmers in a shadowy dream who didn't need to breathe. As I opened fire, I knew why Tex hadn't buzzed me. If he had, brat! Vicky, I thought I heard your voice. Reckon not, sir. This has become part of a personal mission. Five. This must be the place. Maybe he became ill and couldn't leave his studio. Grrr. Sweet dreams, baby. Pow! The melody haunts my reverie. Six. Wham. Knock, knock. Pop. Seven. See that bald-headed guy over there? That's Curly Grogan. He and his mob run half the rackets in this town. Look, Miggy, I've hooked a big one. If you have it, if you have it, you don't need it. If you need it, you don't have it. If you have it, you need more of it. If you have more of it, you certainly don't need less of it. You need it to get it, and you certainly need it to get more of it. But if you don't already have any of it to begin with, you can't get any, get any of it to get started, which means you really have no idea how to get it in the first place, do you? You can share it, sure. You can even stockpile it if you'd like, but you can't fake it. Wanting it, needing it, wishing for it. The point is, is that if you've never had any of it, ever, people just seem to know. <laughs> the language which is in most use today isn't English, it isn't Cantonese, it isn't any other language except binary. Your computers speak more to each other in a given day than the rest of us do put together. And yet we consider English to be the lingua franca. This poem I intercepted. It was sent from an anonymous computer out there in the world to mine. It's spam. I, I uh, transcribed it exactly the way it appeared in my inbox. I assumed it was for the computer because it didn't seem to be for me. Its subject line was a chainsaw. A chainsaw is wisely resplendent. Any cab driver can write a love letter to the paycheck around the inferiority complex, but it takes a real warranty to seek some chainsaw. Indeed, the gentle tomato barely assimilates a blood clot from the stovepipe. Furthermore, the sheriff gets stinking drunk, and a corporation behind the warranty goes deep sea fishing with an orbiting power drill. Now and then, 
the satellite recognizes the microscope. The final chapter in how to write is, oddly enough, how to write. How to write is a mining of Project Gutenberg. I picked 42 books across genre. There's science fiction novels, Tarzan novels, detective novels, all the way through to classics of you know European literature. There's, there's religious texts. There's everything I could find. 42 different texts, all obsessively footnoted. And all I did was pull out, out of these texts, every sentence that included the word write, W-R-I-T-E, or writes, W-R-I-T-E-S, and transcribe them in the order in which they originally appear in those novels. I then arra arranged each block of text, each cross-section, by word count, and just placed them here as an instruction manual on how to write. What, what I found interesting is that suddenly the Tarzan novel isn't about Tarzan, it's about a series of novelists imploring each other to please continue writing. It's about a series of epistolary uh, conversations in which they constantly ask each other, please write me more, please tell me more that suddenly all of the characters in all of the novels that you've read are writers. I will write a letter to my wife and one to my daughter, Kate. I will now step on board my ship and write some letters, which I shall ask you to take to Bridgetown with you. Go down to Captain Marchand's cabin and write your letters. The captain of the pirate sat down in his well-furnished little room to write his letters, and the noise and confusion on deck, the swearing and the singing and the shouting to be heard everywhere did not seem to disturb him in the least. Captain Marchant and Greenway had been waiting in anxious expectation for the re return of Bonnet, and wondering how in the world a man could bring his mind to write letters at such a time as this. So he he merely touched upon Major Bonnet and his vessel and hoped that she might soon write to him and tell him what she cared for him to know, what she cared for him to tell the people of Bridgetown, and what she wished to repose confidentially to his honor. It was perfectly plain, even to Dame Charter, that things had been said in Bridgetown which Mr. Newcomb had not cared to write. I had not thought of your seeing him, Dickory, and I did not write to him, but you will know what to say. He came to this vessel to bring me a message from my daughter, but he is an ill-bred stripling and can neither read nor write. You write well and read, I know that, my good Sir Nightcap, and moreover, you are a fair hand at figures. The only shrewd thing I ever knew your Sir New Nightcap to do was to tell me that you could not read nor write. Had it not been so, I should have sent you to the town to help with the shore the shore end of my affairs, and then you would have been there still, and I would have had no admiral, admiral to write my log and straighten my accounts. He raised himself on his elbow. He clutched at the paper, and clapping it upon the deck, he began to write. If you want to write good copy, you must be where the things are. Well, yes, I propose to write it. Then, for heaven's sake, man, write it up. I, it was agreed that I should write home full accounts of my adventures in the shape of successive letters to McArdle, and that they would, be either, they would should either be edited for the Gazette as they arrived or held back to be published later according to the wishes of Professor Challenger, since we could not yet know what conditions he might attach to those directions which should guide him into the unknown land. There it lies, even as I write, and there can be no question that it is the same. I will write again as the occasion to serves. Tomorrow, or today rather, for it is already dawn as I write, we shall make our first venture into this strange land. When shall I be able to write again? If I shall ever write again, I know not. If your ballpoint pen won't write as you want it to, your life doesn't stop, she was probably thinking. I write my letters with him too. He seemed to love to write more than to sketch. I, I don't see how he could stand up on end to write for anything very long, even with such a magnificent philosophy to bolster him. He won't write anything else. Proudly, he continued to write his rise and fall of the Western Plainsman in a lucid, 
passionate prose, which would evoke an imperishable picture. <laughs> the rise and fall of the Western plainsman. But in 3,000 pages, from now on, he can write whatever the hell he likes, but most of his knowledge of Earth has come from books. He can't write classics about living things unless he sees living things. I feel as a result that I have observed this type of data to the extent that I can write, it, write of it com competently without further study. It is fundamental that if you are to write serious literature, you must rub your nose against the realities of life. But if you aren't going to write serious literature, who will I go on with my painting trips? <laughs> Lewis writes, Susan writes, Neville writes, Ginny writes, even Bertrand has now begun to write, but I cannot write. We shall write in our exercises in ink here. We are all phrases in Bernard's story, things he wishes to write down in his notebook under A or under B. I can write the letters straight off, which I have begun ever so many times. I will write a quick running small hand, exaggerating the downward stroke with the Y and crossing the T thus with a dash. No, I will write the letter tomorrow, di directly after breakfast. What did I write last night if it were not good poetry? Then he stretches his hand for his copybook, a neat volume bound in mottled paper, and writes feverishly long lines of poetry in the manner of whomever he admires most at the moment. When Louis is alone, he sees with astonishing intensity and will write some words that may outlast us all. This is poetry if we do not write it. He picked up his pen half-heartedly, wondering whether he could find something more to write in the diary. Even when you write, even when you write it, you're still thinking in old speak. I've read some of those pieces that you write in the Times occasionally. Where the lottery was concerned, even people who could barely read and write seemed capable of intricate calculations and staggering feats of memory. It was important to write something down. But you write it very elegantly. Write it down and I'll sign it. Anything. He began to write down the thoughts that came into his head. Like all men of the library, I have traveled in my youth. I have wandered in search of the book, perhaps the catalog of catalogs. Now that my eyes can barely decipher what I write, I am preparing to die just a few leagues from the hexagon in which I was born. You are well aware that chemical preparations exist and have existed time out of mind by means of which it is possible to write upon either paper or vellum so that the character shall become visible only when subjected to the action of fire. But yes, I can also write poetry. And write? It is very good that you're able to read and write. Very good. And would you write something for me on this piece of paper? It is excellent how you're able to write. <coughs> Think too for whom you write. I pray I write. In the beginning was the deed. Shall I with chisel, pen, or graver write? Yet write away without cessation as the Holy Ghost dictation. He writes and returns the book. They are expressed in the most plain and simple terms, wherein those people are not mercurial enough to discover above one interpretation and to write a comment upon any law is a capital crime. When one writes a novel about grown people, he knows exactly where to stop, that is, with a marriage. But when he writes of juveniles, he must stop where best he can. That is exactly what the dreamer can do, and no one else but he. And Mr. Stephen is himself a dreamer when he writes and feels like this. It recedes with the years, and I write out my life longhand, a letter to the me that I'll be when it's restored to a clone somewhere, somewhen. Owing to their historical position, it became the vocation of the aristocracies of France and England to write pamphlets against modern bourgeois society. It is agreeable for me to recall and write these things, but I set them down so that my story may lack nothing. Yes, but if you shout in my ear like that one more time, you'll have to write things out for me forever after. Nevertheless, that pencil must scrawl broadly over the sky, and for a long time merely hoping to write on its target. Perhaps you can write to me. You will write at any rate. Have you been reading the stuff I write? <laughs> I can't write it. 
I did not write that message, he stated. Never mind, I'll write it. And lastly, I was recently commissioned by the Capilano Review for their manifestos issue to provide a manifesto on the state of poetry. <laughs> An invitation that's just too good to refuse. This issue has recently come out, and it's, it's, uh, it's a manifesto that not only um, uh, interacts with my, uh, with my writing, but also with, um, I, I feel, with my, edi my editorial position in politics. And uh, because it's Canadian, it ends, uh, like all good manifestos, uh, with the word please. <laughs> Poetry is the last refuge of the unimaginative. Poetry has little to offer outside of poetry itself. Writing, on the other hand, is a much more dynamic space. Poets choose to be poets because they do not have the drive to become something better. Readers are a book's aphorisms. All bad poetry springs from genuine feeling. <laughs> to be natural is to be obvious, and to be obvious is to be inartistic. Poetry, sadly, knows its poetry, while writing doesn't always know its writing. Art is a conversation, not a patent office. Poets in ostrich-like ignorance of the potential of sharing, as opposed to hoarding their texts, are ignoring potentially the most important artistic innovation of the 20th century, collage. What's at stake? Nothing but their own obsolescence. If you don't share, you don't exist. We expect plumbers, electricians, engineers, and doctors to both have a specific and specialized vocabulary and be on the forefront of new advancements in their field, but we scorn poets who do the same. Poets are now judged not by the quality of their writing, but of the, by the infallibility of their choices. Having been unpopular in high school is not just cause for book publication. <laughs> Immature poets imitate. Mature poets steal. The worst thing about poetry <laughs> is poetry. The true artist is known by the use he makes of what he annexes. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. Rules are guidelines for stupid people. In poetry, we applaud me mediocrity and ignore radicality. Poetry has more to learn from graphic design, engineering, architecture, cartography, automotive design, or any other subject than it does from poetry itself. Poets should not be told what, told to write what they know. They don't know anything. That's why they're poets. <laughs> the, the internet is not something that challenges who we are or how we write. It is who we are and how we write. Poets being poets are simply the last to recognize this fact. At its base, the internet is a Borgesian library of perversions and pornography whose only redeemable feature is the card catalog itself. If writing a poem is inherently tragic, it is so because it's hard to believe that the author had nothing better to do. It's inherently tragic because we still choose an outdated form as a medium for argumentation. If we had something to say, why would we choose the poem with its sliver of audience and lack of cultural cachet as the arena to announce that opinion? No more poetry, please. <laughs> Thank you.